All right, good to see everybody again. Hope you're having a good week. Uh, eager, got a big opportunity, and um, eager to get back out on the field and compete this week as well, going to one of the uh, historic venues and all of – uh, college football and Brian Denny Stadium and Saban Field, uh, Coach Saban, who I have so much respect for, for all he meant to the – he still means to the game of football and what he's done uh, for college football than to be in a great environment like that in Tuscaloosa. I was thinking about it earlier, been over there a bunch as an assistant coach at Tennessee when I was a graduate assistant. We obviously played that rivalry game every year and got to go down there as a young coach. And then when I was at – Mississippi State, obviously, uh, played them every year. And then I guess my last time in that stadium was when I was here uh, as an assistant coach, and, and we went over there on a Saturday night a while back as well. So it will be a big challenge, but really cool opportunity for our guys. Um, I read or was told that they're honoring the 1974 uh, championship team over there this weekend that uh, Sylvester Croom, who I worked for at Mississippi State and who gave me my first full-time coaching job in the SEC. He was a member of that team, team captain and All-American and All-SEC. So I believe he'll be there on Saturday. So it'll be great to see Coach Croom, who's meant so much to me in my life on and off the field. And and um, uh, just a great place with a lot of tradition and ton of respect for Coach DeBoer and what he's done in his career. I uh, went and visited a lot of schools after last, not a lot, but talked to a lot of coaches and went and visited some schools uh, after last season. And and Washington and him were going to be one of the places that I was absolutely going to go out and spend some time with just because of the respect I have for him and what he's done in his career, no matter where he's been uh, as a coach as well. And then he got the Bama job, unfortunately for me. And I don't think he was going to allow me to come to Tuscaloosa and spend a few days with him and pick his brain, maybe. But a uh, ton of respect for the job that he does and the first class person and coach he is. And he's a fantastic coach, has a uh, great coaching staff um, offensively uh, with what they're doing and Coach Sheridan, their offensive coordinator. I know Coach DeBoer is heavily involved with that and very creative in what they do. they got really good players. Obviously, starts with the quarterback uh, defensively with Coach Womack and what he's doing. Obviously, his dad was an assistant coach here, so he's very familiar with our program, and he did an awesome job as the head coach at South Alabama and is doing a really good job with their defense. And then they know what they're doing on special teams. They use good players. Uh, they're well coached. They have good schemes. So big challenge for us in all three phases. But I know our guys are eager to get over there and compete and and uh, get back out on the field. So questions? Shane, I know it's not directly maybe apples to apples, but Vandy had a mobile quarterback that gave Alabama lots of trouble. You got a couple of mobile quarterbacks. Do you see something there that maybe y'all can exploit? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that – Vandy put on tape that, frankly, we do um, in the run game uh, as well. So there are certain things. Now, you also got to say to yourself, okay, Vandy has some success against them doing this, so is Alabama going to line up the exact same way and do the same thing? You don't know. But we're going to – you know, be who we are and, and do what we do. But there's certainly, like any game, whether it be the Vanderbilt game or the Western Kentucky and South Florida games that they played this year, there's going to be things that we see on tape that we feel like have a chance to be successful that, that fit us that we'll, uh, that we'll implement. But certainly Vandy did a really good job of uh, moving the ball. They did an awesome job of protecting the football. They did an awesome job of uh, converting on third down. I think they were 12 of 18, David. So I'd like to copy that for sure, their ability to stay on the field and, and score points. But they had a really good plan. But I think the biggest thing is Vandy played really, really hard uh, and really, really physical against them as well. What are some of the detail, details that you can share about Bengali and his decision to redshirt? And um, he met, he came in my office yesterday and told me that he was redshirting. Uh, I told him that that's not quite how this works, that we can have a discussion about his role and his redshirting best. And uh, we went back and forth a little bit. I think his situation's a little bit different than somebody. There's guys on our team right now, Hale, that we've had conversations with that, look, we're doing what we have to do in 2024 to win football games. But if we can save your redshirt year and not play you in five games, we will. Freshmen that have played some, older guys that have started that have played some uh, this year that we've had those conversations with that maybe don't have the role on offense, defense that they want. But, you know, he was a guy that played – uh, uh, season high in snaps on Saturday at linebacker 
that was going to continue to play more for us moving forward. My job is to do what's best for the team. And what was best for the team, in my mind, is golly continuing to play and help us go beat Alabama or try to beat Alabama this weekend. And uh, he didn't quite feel the same way. So in the end, I made the decision for him that it's probably best to move on. With with his departure, who are some of the guys that will kind of fill in that spot? I guess Mo. Mo Caba, Fred Johnson. You know, we had, uh, we've had we got a rotation there. If you watch, I mean, I know you watch this on Saturday, but Debo, Bam, uh, D-Knight, and, and Golly. Those four guys all rotated through, you know, so we're fortunate that we still have D-Knight, Debo, and Bam. <clears throat> and then Bo Caba has played a lot of football for us and is really doing a good job on special teams and, and defense for us. I love what he's about right now. And then Fred Johnson's a guy that is doing a great job on special teams and will continue to come along. So uh, we're good at linebacker. I met with uh, some of the leaders of our defense uh, to make sure they were on the same page with with – my decision as far as to handle that, and they were 100% on board, and, and uh, we're moving on and wish him well and wherever his next um, next stop is. I appreciate all he did for us, but but we're not getting ready for 25 around here. We're, we're trying to win in 24. Shane, I know you were disappointed in the uh, penalties from the old Miss game. How do you go about teaching that or emphasizing that? It seems one thing you could teach – technique in a certain way but the awareness part of the game is it you standing in front of everybody is it position coaches uh getting home how do you get that message across yeah it's a combination of things the, the ones that bother me obviously are the pre-snap and post-snap um penalties do we want to be the least penalized team in the sec absolutely does that mean that if you're the least penalized team you're going to win no I'm sure you guys are aware because y'all do y'all's analysis and breakdowns and studies of our penalties. So I'm sure you guys are aware that last season, the three most penalized teams in the SEC had 31 wins between them. Two of them won 11 games and the other one won nine games. And they were the three most penalized teams in the SEC. And the least penalized team didn't go to a bowl game last season. So you're exactly right, and I'm exactly right. The penalties make me sick. The penalties are going to happen. It's the pre-snap penalties that make you want to throw up. And it's the post-snap penalties that we had on Saturday that we can't have. And the last one of those I remember that a player had, maybe I'm wrong, was was at East Carolina, my second game as the head coach, over on our sideline. We got a taunting penalty. So we've been good with the post-snap. It's the pre-snap where we got to be better. You understand that some penalties are going to happen. Some penalties get called that probably aren't good calls. Uh, but what we try and do is in practice emphasize technique, where when we're doing any kind of blocking drill, we're screaming and yelling, get our hands inside. Um, today, you know, we've done this all along, but we did a whole lot of, as you can imagine, in practice today, so our defense doesn't jump. Not that we're all of a sudden starting that this week. We've been doing that as long as I've been the head coach here, but we clearly haven't done a good enough job of it. Um, we show video of penalties. Here's why this is a penalty. Tori and Gray uh, in front of the whole team. Here's a pass interference penalty. Like So we all hear, like, what's the technique that we need to play with right here so we don't get this penalty? Lonnie Teasley, hey, we got a holding penalty right here. What are we teaching right now so everybody's on the same page about what, we, what uh, the penalty is? So uh, we're looking at ways to emphasize it better. It's too many you realize that penalties are going to happen. But to answer your question, I think it's just constantly educating, holding guys accountable, which we do, whether it be pre-snap, post-snap, during the snap, and then just really just trying to emphasize and teach better than we have um, over uh, uh, throughout the week, meetings and practice. So hope that answers your question. I'm sorry. After a game like Saturday, offensively, what's kind of the process like of kind of getting back to the drawing board schematically and kind of figuring out the what you guys do really well on the offensive side of the ball and kind of establishing that identity for the rest of the year? Yeah, um, just offense, just like offense, defense, and special teams. Um, game ends on Saturday night, and the assistant coaches have their process, and then – uh, I think I mentioned to you guys on the teleconference, I was in here Sunday morning early and I watch the tape multiple times uh, before I meet with the offensive staff at 11. And when I meet with them at 11 a.m. on Sunday mornings, I've talked to them about, you know, what I see and and 
issues and what we need to do going forward, and that's every week. And then at that point, the offensive staff has had those meetings as well. And then uh, we talked on Sunday about let's look at you know what we're doing. Let's look at who we're doing it with. Do we have the right people in the right places? And then let's look at how we're coaching it to be done because – we weren't good enough on Saturday, and, and how do we finish drives better? I told the team this morning, I think we had seven drives on Saturday where we crossed the 50-yard line, and we got three points out of it. So when you cross the 50, you're basically 15 yards away from being in field goal range, and for whatever reason, we didn't do a good enough job of finishing, and we haven't all season. I know we're not good enough on third down, so it's really just taking a step back um, again and saying – what, who, and how we're doing things. And then let's also look at what we're doing in practice. Let's look at how we're teaching it. Let's look at how we're practicing. Because I don't think there's a lot of things that I looked at on Saturday and said, well, that was a horse crap scheme. Like, why are we doing that? Or why are we calling this? To me, it was more just the the details and the execution of how we're doing it. And, you know, if we have a, a mesh concept called on offense and the linebacker for the other team opens up and walls you we got to know that we just can't run right down the middle of the guy twice because you're going to get called for offensive pass interference and that's what happens so let's really hammer down the details of okay if they do wall us we can't run right through the guy. We got to be better about talking about how to avoid the guy and whatnot. Or if we have this run scheme called and they play a little bit of a different technique than maybe we expected on the defensive line, how we can block this play no matter what they line up in, if that makes sense. So that starts in practice with how we teach and how we script and how we call things. And we've tried to do you know, an even better job of that this week so we can – uh, not so much go back to the drawing board, but be better at executing Saturday morning, I guess, than what we were uh, last week. Thank you. As a head coach with a philosophy, is there a line a player cannot cross an on-the-field celebration, demonstration, before you have to bench them? I liked it better when you were at Dabo's press conference the other night, Phil. Um, <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Um a line, um, I don't know if I have a hard, I don't have a hard, fast rule in that uh, if you do this, that this is going to happen. We try and talk to our guys all the time about how we handle our business and how we do things. And I know you're, re- you're, you're specifically asking about the Dylan Stort play, which is unacceptable. And Dylan Stort feels awful about that play. Dylan Stort's a really good kid, and Dylan Stort's mom feels awful about that play, and she was obviously very emotional after the game, and I know all the uh, social media um, angels that have never done anything wrong want me to just tar and feather him out there in the middle of five points for his mistake. It doesn't quite work that way. Uh, Was he held accountable uh, in this building? Yes. Was there punishment within this building uh, for what he did? Yes. Uh, But we also, we care about Dylan. We love Dylan and we got Dylan's back too. A lot of people don't, but the people in this building have his back and he knows he needs to be better. And it was unacceptable uh, without a doubt, but he's a young kid that got caught up in the emotions. There's a lot, I'm not excusing it at all. There's a lot of things that built up before that play. Uh, some back and forth that started in the first quarter. And in the end, he let his emotions get the best of him and did something he can't do. And, um, you know, we try and educate him and also realize he's a, you know, 18 year old young man and he's ours. And it's our job to help him just like a, a parent would do with a child um, when a child makes a mistake in a lot of ways. But certainly, uh, we've talked about as a team, though, that there's a right way and a right uh, – there's a way that we want to handle ourselves on the field and the class that we want to play with. And if something repeatedly happens, then, yeah, there's something – you have the decisions to make. But, um, you know, we, we feel good about how we've handled that situation. 
Oh, I'm sorry. No, you're fine. Going off of that, uh-huh. Demetrius was just in here. He told us <coughs> that he talked to Dylan Saturday, Sunday. Just overall, Demetrius has kind of given us insight on how he carries himself on and off the field. What's that like having him in the program, and what does he bring as a leader mentally, physically, everything? Yeah, I love Demetrius Knight. Um when he was making the this when we were recruiting him, I um I called Jeff Collins, who's was his head coach at Georgia Tech and is now at North Carolina, and I asked uh Jeff, and I don't want to get Jeff in trouble with any of the players that he also has coached in his career, but he said Demetrius Knight is probably my favorite player that I've ever been around in my career. And I'm like, wow, okay. And I see exactly what he means. He is just a unbelievable person, player, um, just ha- knowing the right things to say at the right time to not just the players, but to the coaches, you know, where he'll come up and say something to me, which I'm like, golly, man, that's exactly what I needed to hear at that moment. And uh, we had a team meeting on Friday night where it was – scheduled to go you know we do a thing with Derek Moore on Friday nights before we start special teams and football meetings and and it was a, it was scheduled to go for 25 minutes and D Knight got up and talked in that meeting and we were about 10 minutes into it and he said what he needed to say and the whole room was like that's it like we ain't gonna do anything else if this one's over let's get the special teams it was almost like a mic drop type thing I mean he's just uh he is awesome, and has, he's a great player, but even better person. And he's the same every single day. And love what he's about. I, th- I think after a game like Saturday, with all the things that went wrong, people can just want you to just have so many wholesale changes and shift everything about your philosophy. It seems like to you, it was small, a lot of small things that piled up. Is that accurate? And when you met with the team on Sunday, Monday, was the message, hey, guys, we just have to clean up these little things rather than wanting to change everything about your program after one loss? Yeah, we're certainly not changing everything about the program, that's for sure. I mean, we've lost games around here, and typically we've always uh, bounced back. Um, I'm not going to – I'm not going to bury my head in the sand, though, and say, okay, well, we had some uh, critical penalties that took points off the board against LSU – and then we had some critical penalties that were pre-snap and post-snap against Ole Miss and saying, well, we just got to be a little bit better there. I mean, there's clearly an issue, and I got to address it uh, for sure. Um, uh, giving up two explosive passes on defense when we played pretty good defense for the most part, but two explosive passes just because of not playing the quite te- the technique the quite the right way on one and a little bit of a miscommunication in the secondary on the other one. Is something that you need to address. Scoring three points is scoring three points. Um, we had some things on special teams where we left some plays out there because we just we weren't as detailed as we needed to be. So I think for me on Sunday, it was guys like, I don't have to come in here and talk to you guys about playing physical. Y'all play physical as crap. Um, I don't have to come in here and talk to you guys about playing hard. Y'all play hard. Like nobody questions your effort. Where we have to be better is just understanding in this league – it's a fine line, and there's the details are magnified. We don't have games in this league where you can just roll out the ball and you're going to win by a couple touchdowns because you're that much better. You've seen that. We've seen that in this conference. Every Saturday is a war, and the teams that prepare the right way during the week and are detailed on Saturdays and execute are the ones that are going to be successful. And in my mind, I wouldn't say it was little things, but we weren't as detailed as we needed to be last Saturday. And – I truly believe this. My dad used to tell his teams this all the time and me and and just in life, things are never as bad as they seem. Things are never as good as they seem. And, and I don't think things were as bad where I'm just going to come in here on Sunday morning and blow up everything in the program. Um, You're constantly evaluating. I talked about that last season and I made changes at the end of the season that I felt like I needed to make. Uh, But it's also, we're, we're five games into this thing and we're playing a lot of young players in spots, and we have to be better than what we've been. I'm not excusing it, but it's also staying the course because if we have a poor performance, we had a bad outing. And if we have a poor performance and I come in here on Sunday morning and I'm just you know, going nuclear on everything in this program, I'm not sure if that's the best thing for our players. Um, you hold guys accountable, players, coaches, staff. You continue to be demanding. You hold yourself accountable. You look at how we need to be better this week and what we need to do, and then you try and make those make those changes to be better 
the next week out because last Saturday was nowhere near good enough and just really disappointing to, you know, um, play like we did, but just really just to have the as poor a first quarter as we did. That's the disappointing thing, and, and part of that's me, but, um, you know, also trying to find the positives from Saturday and how you continue to build up on those as well. Yeah, Shane, kind of going off that, what do you feel like you learned most about yourself as a coach on Saturday from the mistakes, the decisions, just anything in general from that game on Saturday? And how do you take all the positives and negatives away from that game and move forward? Um, good question. Uh, learned about myself. Um, probably just I kicked myself in the butt. I'm going to say this and people are going to be like, oh, my God, Beamer says that he doesn't regret calling the fake punt. I don't regret calling the fake punt. I'm mad at myself for not calling time out before the snap because the whole key on that play was to um, was to sprint up to the line as quick as possible, thinking that their defensive tackles would not be in their stance yet, which they weren't, and then snap the ball really, really quick, and then we, we need to get a yard. And if you look at us, we get to the line of scrimmage really quick. Defensive tackles are standing up. There's one actually pointing and not even looking at the ball. And if we just snap it, then it's successful. But for whatever reason, and that starts with me, that we didn't, you know, uh, uh, emphasize enough how quick we need to be. That's my fault, uh, clearly. But when we got to the line and I knew that it was taking way too long and we're allowing them to dig their cleats into the ground, call timeout, Shane. And that's the one that I kick myself in the butt for still. That I'm, It's like I told the team, it's like a car wreck in slow motion. And I could see it happening, and I didn't call timeout. And that's, that's one. I don't know if I learned something. Um, you can add that to your article next week, Lulu, the mistakes I've made and things like that. That's one of them. But um, probably just that, that you see it, Shane, just call timeout. You know, it's not going to – I'll let it ride. I had faith that we could make it work, but – the longer it went, the less likely that was to work. So that's one thing, just not that I haven't. I mean, I've trusted my instincts before, um, and that was one where I wish I had been a little bit more decisive and just call time out and don't snap it. And then, you know, outside of that, I think it's just really got to got to coach better. You know, we talk, I told our staff yesterday, we got coaches that love to coach. We got players that love to play. Let's do a great job of doing that this week and, and be better um, than what we were. But, but it's every game too, though, Jack, that I look and how can I be better and mistakes I made. And I made a bunch of them on Saturday and, and um, certainly need to be better this week for, uh, for sure too. I think on your radio show a couple of weeks ago, you said something about being close in recruiting on a lot of guys and yeah. late last week happens. And I guess, yeah, four, four, yeah. What what can you share about? Yeah, so those welcome run? home tweets were catching up from the weekend, but there was also a new one as well. So there was a, um, there were four from Friday on. And thank you for listening to the radio show too. I, I knew I would get that. By That's the way, snuck there you that. go. What, yep. Good plug how, for Carolina call. Yeah, What's the question? I'm sorry. Yeah, I just <laughs> how, how do you feel like things are going uh, with recruiting right now? Just in general. Fantastic. Um beyond uh beyond great it's uh it's a it's a it's a testament to our fan base and the environment that they create in williams bryce stadium that whether it's 12 noon national television sec game seven o'clock espnu game versus a mid-american conference team or what did we play the other day 330 national television game and an sec game but that environment in that stadium is the same every week and it's lights out and it's rocking and recruits see that and uh, we've got a great group of commits we got a great group of guys that were at the game on saturday i mean some of the best players from the state of georgia from the state of virginia from the state of north carolina from the state of alabama from the state of south carolina that were there on um, on Saturday. So we got, we've had some unbelievable players that have been here and have seen us play. They see the young talent. They see the fact that we're starting a true freshman left tackle. We got a redshirt freshman quarterback. They see a, tr- a true freshman starting at receiver. They see basically a starter at tight end and Mike Smith, true freshman. They see a true freshman at defensive end in Dillon. Uh, they see Fred John- Johnson running around out there, David Busey. So they see a lot of freshmen playing. They see the young talent. They see the environment in that stadium and 
and credit to our coaches and staff for the way they've been able to get here guys but get guys here but um um yeah it's been really really good I took a lot of crap this summer for losing a commit at the Beamer for Birdies golf tournament and I wanted to tweet an emoji of a golf club or something the other night after I put out that welcome home but I figured I need to focus more on Ole Miss which I needed to do more of clearly too going back to your defense when listening to your op- your opponents uh head coaches press conferences the defense is typically what they're pointing out first yeah over these five games what is your defense doing consistently well that's putting these head coaches on notice I think our ability to pass uh, to rush the passer for sure uh we've done a good job I don't want to like jinx ourselves but we've done a good job for the most part of stopping the run um and we've done a good job of pressuring the passer we play a an attacking style of defense here it's why Ole Miss was double moving us so much the other day we play aggressive in the secondary it was while they were you know utilizing the snap count to try and slow our pass rush down we know that we have to be better but I think that's the main thing is consistently stopping the run and um and and rushing the passer I think certainly jumps out on tape we've got older defensive tackles like we've talked about and we've got talented defensive ends but then the way our linebackers are flying around and then I like the way our secondary is playing too you know I know we gave up the two deep balls the other day but they also they won a lot of what we call 50 50 balls meaning it's you and the receiver and it's one-on-one and somebody's going to come down with it and they won they won a bunch of um a bunch of theirs the other day for sure too hey coach got Robbie Ashford involved early in the game didn't work out how you guys had hoped but um He's someone you said you wanted to get more involved in the game plan. How, in your opinion, does that benefit the offense, getting two quarterbacks involved that seemingly are both good at similar things? Yeah, I think it's um, certainly good for a lot of reasons. Robbie's a talented guy. It gives defenses something to prepare for, something else to prepare for. When we were getting ready to play Akron, they played a two-quarterback system. And um, when you have two guys that can run the football uh, well – because of their size and speed, like Lenoris and Robbie can, it makes uh, it makes a difference without a doubt. Make them prepare for it, but also, you know, we don't want to. Let's be real. Lenoris is a weapon with his legs, but we also don't want Lenoris carrying the ball twenty times a game either in in this league. So it's another guy that we can get back there, and we try and each week get our uh, most talented guys, playmakers the ball in their hands and I would put Robbie and Lenoris both uh, in that category for sure nothing for Rick this week take it off I didn't say you could get one in Allen's up but if you have one we'll give you one (laughs) all right gotcha go ahead Alan uh, you've talked a lot about sacks and some of the problems to protection. Is it possible to change much in, you know, one week or one, you know, one preparation or is it just adding a wrinkle here or a wrinkle there to kind of try to stop the bleeding in some spots? Yeah, um, I think it's hard to wholesale change, but I wouldn't say that we're um, – we try and mix up the protections. You know, I mean, Saturday we had some things where we wanted to get the ball quick out of Lenoris's hands. We had some RPOs where, you know, we got a chance to get the ball out of his hands. When Ole Miss, like they're they're really good on the defensive line, um, really good. And we didn't want to sit back in the pocket all day. So in a lot of our um, max type protections where we're keeping a running back and a tight end in, we tried to get it where we had, you know, four hands on most of their top guys, meaning, you know, two people, uh, whether it be, on number two or 38 or whatever he wore, 89. Um, Their best guys trying to get multiple hands on him and trying to max protect so those guys don't beat us, uh, move in the pocket, which we've done. So we try and, you know, we try and mix it up, uh, but we've got to be – that's one of the things that we're still looking at. I mean, we've just um, – we we have to be better. Six sacks is six sacks no matter how you spin it and it's not good enough and it's a shame because we're we're running the ball fairly successfully and um which should make your pass protection I don't want to say easier but a little bit better and we haven't been good enough so it's not really wholesale changes it's just continuing to look at what we're doing and how we're doing it and each week is different too I mean Alabama's got a talented defensive line but their interior guys are built a little bit different and play a little bit of a different style than uh, Ole Miss's did and 
uh, at, at, and the, the front seven's just different. So I think every week's different schematically and then the personnel that you're facing uh, also. I, I think it was pretty established coming into the year that the wide receiver position would just kind of evolve over over the course of the year, figure some things out. How five games in, do you feel like you, you all have a pretty good grasp on on uh, the strengths and the weaknesses of, of the uh, room as a whole? And how – where, where do you see them needing to get better? What are you most proud of that they've done so far? Yeah, they've certainly evolved. I don't think there's any question, John, they've gotten better since the beginning of the season. Um, again, when we talk about the details of how to do things, they're right in the middle of that, just like all of our positions are. So we have to be more detailed. But I like the way that they continue to get better. There's no question in my mind that Nick Harbour has gotten better as a player since the beginning of the season, and you could say that with a lot of guys. You know, we've actually uh, started a different receiver the last three games. Nick started Saturday. The Saturday before that was Gage. The Saturday before that, Dre was one of our starters, and and um, Mazio's been consistent out there as well. And uh, I th- we feel like we've got a solid group of guys. There's no question about it that have all flashed at times. And and just like every position on our roster, we're continuing to try and get those guys better. But then maybe the ones that aren't playing a lot at the receiver position, we're in. We're going to be at the halfway point of the regular season, or over halfway after Saturday. And we got a lot of football left, so we'll continue to bring everybody in that room along. But I like the progress those guys have made. I think Coach Furry's doing a, a great job as well um with uh the coaching and the recruiting i came up with this one last night i don't know if you guys like it i was telling we were facetiming recruits last night and the expression you'll like this there's what the expression is a flurry of activity so i told him it's a furry of activity i like that david i mean i told the recruit i was literally we were facetiming him and i said i literally just came up with that as i was talking to you that what we did from a recruiting standpoint there you go hail a furry of activity yeah, I know. Based on y'all's reaction, it's not as good as I thought um, it was. Anything else? Thank you, guys. Y'all have a safe trip.